Hello, everybody. I hope you are doing well. Thanks for joining me on this. Um, it's really lovely to see you all. Um, some of you I know as students, some of you I know as parents. And when your kids were here, you came to lots of concerts. And then when your kids graduated, I didn't see you anymore and I missed you. Um, but it's awesome to see you in this setting. I hope you are doing well and staying healthy. Uh, we are going to get started with our conversation. As I mentioned earlier, there's that form in Google, and I would say about 50 of you kind of took that little quiz, and I'm going to share the results, and we can start our conversation from there. So bear with me as you hopefully, can somebody, Zach, yes, you can see the form that I'm referring to? You're awesome. Right. I just wanted to make sure that that is happening. Okay. And I'm going to click on the responses so we can get a sense of what that looks like. And you guys can all get a sense of kind of where your mutual attendees are answering, how your mutual attendees are answering. Okay, so what month was Beethoven born in? Overwhelming majority of you said December, and that is correct. Um, Beethoven was born, we think, um, first so why is it that we think? So here's the thing, Beethoven was baptized on December 17th. And back in those days, because there was such a high infant mortality rate, um, kids were usually baptized a day or two days right after they were born. Hence, we think it's December 16th, but December 15th is also accepted as Beethoven's birthday as well. And obviously back then people, the church records were probably more accurate than governmental records since the church kind of served as government entity in some ways. So Beethoven was, um, most likely born on December 16th. <clears throat> now, if he was born on December 16th, he also shares a birthday with a very prominent literary figure. Um, Jane Austen was also born on December 16th. Jane Austen was born five years after Beethoven and died 10 years before Beethoven, which is a bit of a shame. Um, so she lived a rather short life. So that brings us to our next question. By 2021, how old would Beethoven be? So here's the thing, since his birthday was in December, if we're counting it right now, it's still his 250th birthday, but by December 16th or 17th, then it would definitely be his 251st birthday. All right, so which city was Beethoven born in? Um, now the overwhelming answer is Bonn. 30% think it's Leipzig, a smaller percentage think it's Berlin, and then 16% think it's Vienna. Now, I can totally understand why people think it might be Vienna because it is understood as the musical capital of the classical music world back in those days. And Berlin is now the capital of what we know as Germany. So completely understandable that people think it's that. Leipzig is always affiliated with a music as a musical city, thanks to Bach, who spent the latter half of his life as a teacher at the St. Thomas School there, and also Mendelssohn as well, so who was also affiliated with the city. But Beethoven was actually born in Bonn. Um, Bonn is probably not as well known nowadays as it was back in those days. Back in those days, it was kind of considered a city, a thoroughfare. A lot of people travel there and the city was very much like any other city at that time. The center of town life was around um, the city square and the city church or the cathedral. Beethoven's grandfather shared the same name, Ludwig von Be van Beethoven, and Lu he was a composer, the grandfather was a composer, so you could say that music ran in his family. And in some ways, you know, that's similar to a lot of other composers of the time. Bach's family was musical. When Bach was young, he was sent as an apprentice to, you know, some of the extended families. The way he learned music was by copying a lot of the music that he kind of stole from his cousin's covers. And that's actually also how he lost his sight later in life because he spent a lot of time in not very great light copying little notes. He also had four sons, which he promptly put to work as soon as they could hold a pen in their hands because they were copying out parts for him. So Beethoven grew up, you could say he had music in his blood. His grandfather was very well respected in Bonn. His father was also a musician. His father was a tenor in the cathedral choir, though his father nearly as well respected, partly because he wasn't as good of a musician, but the other part was also because his father was a drunk and abusive, so not a good guy to begin with. Um, 
as many of you know, Beethoven went deaf later in his life. And some have attributed that deafness to the fact that his father knocked him around a lot when he was young. Beethoven was the eldest of three sons and a little girl that was um, later died before all the other brothers. And when Beethoven was young, he definitely showed musical promise. So his dad wanted to make him like the second Mozart. At that time, Mozart was touring Europe. You know, Mozart died in 1791 and Beethoven was born in 1770. So as Beethoven was growing up, he surely would have heard about Mozart. His father would have heard about Mozart. And, you know, Mozart was going around with his dad and his sister performing for all the big royal houses in Europe. And in the process, gaining wealth and fame. And his dad actually wanted Beethoven to do the same and made Beethoven lie about his age, which also explains why Beethoven later in life was actually kind of confused about his own age. His father made him tell other people that he was younger than he actually was, like told people he was six when he was actually eight, trying to make him look more impressive. But Beethoven was not having it. Beethoven was pretty stubborn and from a very young age and had a temper from a very young age. He would rather take the abuse from his dad than to play on command by his dad. So yes, you can, I think, if I'm sure you know some of his music, so you can probably hear that in some of his music. All right, so which one was a portrait of Beethoven? And let me go back to the pictures. So um, this number one is Beethoven. Number two is actually a picture of Rossini. Uh, for those of you that are opera fans, I am sure you have heard Rossini. For those of you that are not opera fans, I'm sure you would have heard some of his music. If you know the da 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 yeah, that's by Rossini. It's from his William Tell opera, and that's from the Overture to the Opera. Number three is a picture of young Felix Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn was also a bit of a prodigy himself, except he had a very different dad. Uh, Mendelssohn came from a fairly wealthy family, actually a pretty wealthy family. So when he was composing, you know, like when he was 13 and he was writing his octets, his dad was like, oh, you're writing this? Okay, I'll hire an orchestra to play your music. Not exactly the kind of condition that Beethoven had. So somebody who definitely grew up slightly differently. Um, picture number four is probably the least familiar to you all and probably to most people. Um, this is Hummel. Hummel is probably nowadays most known for a trumpet uh, sonata, uh, sorry, trumpet concerto that he wrote, even though in his day, he's a contemporary of Beethoven and he was more known as a pianist back in those days more than anything else. But his lasting legacy is that trumpet concerto. Okay, so going back to our responses, most of you got that it was um, picture number one. Some of you pick Hamo and some of you pick Mendelssohn. Okay, so was Haydn a teacher of Beethoven? It's a little complicated. So the official answer is yes. The unofficial answer though is it's complicated. So when Beethoven showed a lot of promise, um, the rich people in his town, the elector, who was kind of the prince of the town, you know, said, okay, we're gonna get some money together. We're gonna send this very talented young man to Vienna so he could study with Haydn. And he even said that, you know, the electors to him, from the hands of Haydn, you shall receive the spirit of Mozart. So they have hopes for Beethoven. So the first time Beethoven left Bonn to go to Vienna, he was supposed to go and study with Haydn, except as soon as he got to Vienna, his dad, uh, his mother and his little sister passed away very suddenly. So then he went back and the elector was not happy because you know he didn't have anything to show for except for debt that the elector had to pay. But then when Beethoven went back again later, he did quote unquote study with Haydn. By that, I meant he did go and have composition lessons with Haydn. The problem was Haydn by this time was fairly well known, very prominent, definitely consider um, a great composer in his own time. He kind of considered himself Papa Haydn, you know, kind of this um, elder statesman who is about to help these young composers. 
And he was from a different era, a different tradition. His idea of composition at the root of it, the philosophical root of it was different than what Beethoven wanted to achieve. So he wanted Beethoven to write these things and Beethoven didn't want to write them. So the two of them kind of, um, they butted heads a great deal, shall we say. So while you know this was happening, Beethoven also lied to Haydn, which is not a good thing to do to anybody, least of all your teacher, because he gave Haydn these compositions, which he claimed that he wrote while he was studying with Haydn. So Haydn then sent it back to Bonn to the people who gave Beethoven all of this money to go study in Vienna to be like, oh, look at what he's been doing. And of course, the people in Bonn recognized these work as in, oh, he wrote these when he was here. So Beethoven was caught in a lie. Haydn was not happy with him. To Haydn's credit, though, Haydn did not blow his cover, shall we say. Haydn still gave him all of his access to like the Vienna salons. These were, you know, living rooms of people who were wealthy, people who were hosting concerts. He connected Beethoven to a lot of the prominent musicians and to the prominent patrons in Vienna to help Beethoven get started in his career. So to Haydn's credit, he didn't hold it against him. Um, Beethoven was perhaps not nearly as gracious. When Beethoven was publishing some of his first works, Haydn wanted him to include the lying student of Joseph Haydn. And Beethoven was like, no, I'm not doing that. So relationship wise, I mean, I think you see that streak of stubbornness continue as Beethoven grow into his young adulthood that hasn't changed. But like I said, Haydn was actually very gracious and didn't quite hold that against them, thankfully. So what instrument did Beethoven play? Overwhelmingly, you all picked the piano, which I totally understand. Beethoven wrote 32 piano notas, which pianists of today consider the New Testament. Uh, we consider the 48 well-tempered players by Bach to be Old Testament and Beethoven's sonata to be the New Testament. Beethoven also wrote 10 sonatas for piano and viol. Now, these are not works that were for the viol, uh, for the violin, but accompanied true chamber music by the name are sonata for piano and violin. They're meant to be equal partners in these works. Um, ben himself enjoyed playing the viola, and so did Mozart actually. And whenever people, whenever Mozart plays for music, actually rather play the viola part than anything else. So this is a bit of a trick question, because he played all work. He played the piano, he played the violin, he played the viola, and he played the horn. He played the horn back in when he was born, because obviously when your parent is a musician, you probably have musician friends who showed up to the house. And if you are a curious young person who wanted to learn, it wasn't hard to get somebody to teach you. And back in those days, the horn as an instrument was what we call not velved. So nowadays, when you see a horn player play, their left hand would move and there would be three, actually technically with the palm, there would be four keys there that they could move so they could get different pitches. Back in the days of Haydn and Beethoven, and actually almost all the way up to Brahms as well, horn players would have to carry this box of tubing. There were different lengths because in order to play different keys, you would have to stick in different lengths of tubing to get the different notes you want. So <clears throat> if you were looking at scores by Mozart or by Beethoven, the horn part would be horn in G or horn in D. And what happens, the horn players see that, then they pull out their D tubing, they stick in a horn, and they would play in that key. So this is before they have valves. But yes, so Beethoven actually knows how to play all four. So in his middle life, overwhelmingly, and starting in his mid thirties, this would be when he had gotten to Vienna, got to Vienna in his late twenties, early thirties. He was starting to gain a reputation for himself as a pianist. Back in those days, um, battle of the pianist was a big thing. You know, you would go to somebody's house and you would show each other off in these salons and Beethoven was a very good pianist. He showed a lot of prowess and a lot of people were very impressed by what he was able to do. 
he was also gaining reputation for himself as a composer. He was publishing his first opus, you know, opus number two. He just finishes symphony number one and two. And then he started to get this ringing in his ear. And it's similar to what people probably nowadays call tintinitis, where you hear this ring in your ears. The problem was that nobody back then quite knew what it was. And all of the doctors who treated him prescribed things like, oh, put almond oil down your ear or go take a bath in the Danube. And obviously medical technology back in those days were not nearly what they are today. And Beethoven's condition, it did not improve. It got progressively worse. And I'm actually reading a book right now. It's called Hearing Beethoven, in which they explore exactly what it was that he might have been dealing with. The problem was that, you know, you're a young person who is, you can say, at the beginning of the prime of your career and are losing the one sense that one can say is perhaps the most important to you. It's like somebody who is starting to become a prominent painter and they're losing their sight or they're starting to become colorblind. So for Beethoven, this was incredibly frightening, incredibly discouraging, and he was driven into depression and he was even suicidal. We have um, a last will and testament from him that he wrote around this time that he wrote in a place called Helgestadt, that is a suburb outside of Vienna. So back in those days in Vienna, if you had any money, you would leave the city in the summer because the city stank in the summer. There was no refrigeration and you can imagine all the lovely rotting whatever plus the body odors. So if you had any money, people left the city in the summer. And Helgstadt was a place that Beethoven went to this summer to compose, to take walks in the country. And while he was there, he wrote this last will and testament to his two younger others, basically explaining, you know, I think it was almost like a suicide note. He didn't quite mail it though. And it wasn't found until after his death. And in the letter, he talks about having to hide the fact that he was going deaf. He said, you know, I walk down the street and people would think that I am crazy because I don't say hello back when they say hello. And he talks about how do I explain to the world, you know, I am a musician and I can't hear you. How can I say to them, you know, speak louder? And he was in the middle of the letter or the testament, he, it sounded like he was ready to commit suicide. You know, he was somebody who believed in his own destiny. He believed that he was put on earth to write music. So I think we can probably all relate to how this might be devastating. I think losing one's hearing or losing any sense that a person has would be devastating to anyone at any age, but it's even more so when you feel like this is the one sense you need in order to do the work that you feel like you're destined to do. Now, in the middle of the letter, it kind of turned around and he basically said, here's the thing though, I don't, I'm not done yet. He's saying, I have a lot to say, I have more to do and I'm not done yet. So I'm gonna keep going. And pretty much um, people started to know that he was going deaf because he started in tools to help himself. Um, Mazel is a guy who nowadays is known for he, people say he invented the metronome. He's more like somebody who perfected the metronome. But he also made what they call the ear trumpet for Beethoven. So it was a tube that looked like a backwards, um, you know, those old gramophones with the bell and not nearly as large, but it was something like that in which Beethoven would stick into one ear and people would try to speak into that. So maybe he could hear them. So ear trumpet is something you can find at the Beethoven Museum in Bonn and conversation books. It got to the point where Beethoven could only converse with people 
um, if the other people wrote down what they wanted to say to him. I mean, he could speak to them, but they couldn't speak to him and have themselves be understood. So we have stacks and stacks of these conversation books that Beethoven had with other people. He also carried, or he also had a slate, one of those chalk slates. So you could write something really quick, erase it, you know, and write something again. So these were the ways that, you know, he adapted to his new environment. There's actually a really cool documentary about Beethoven's hearing machine. What happened later was he actually had um, Broadwood was a really London piano company. They said Beethoven and then he built this cone shape over it, basically trying to get much as, as much sound as he could out of the instrument. It's um, which is kind of fascinating because they try to create what that's like and they try to make recordings of what that could possibly have sounded like. So if you're interested in something like I say, go check out. It's fun to know what's going on there. Okay. Um, so did Kevin stay away from politics? Maybe three of you say false and you are correct. So obviously, beta Looks like Robert may have fallen off right here. Let's see, she'll hopefully come back if she just timed out. Were you guys getting some scratchiness with her audio? Yes. Okay, so I, I was hearing that and wondering what we can do to help that. I'll see if she can take out her earbuds. I didn't know if it was just on my end. We'll see. Oh, you know, I think it's my internet. I keep getting message that my internet is unstable. <laughs> so if there's anything you need me to repeat, let me know. Uh, I'm assuming I am not sharing my screen anymore. No, and sometimes, so Ruth, if you that. shut your video off, and it sometimes improves the audio as well. Oh, I can do that. Um, Zach, please do speak up if you're losing me. Okay, we will do. Okay. Screen looks great. Okay. Uh, okay. So, did we get the politics question? Uh, Not yet. So, Beethoven did. Perfect. Okay. So, did Beethoven stay away from politics? Uh, not, not quite. So, here's the thing about Beethoven. Um, he did not march down the street like everybody, like, you know, what you may think of it as involvement in politics. He did not write pamphlets like Wagner did. What Beethoven did was um, he showed it in personal ways, shall we say. So there is an anecdote that's recounted by Goethe, uh, the famous German literary figure. Um, him and Beethoven were in one of the gardens on a day, on a very fine day in Vienna. And back in those days, you know, gardens were where you went to be seen. If you were a wealthy person, you would take drives in the park. If you were a wealthy person, you might show off your new clothes at the park. And this is also where people of all classes might have gathered. You would have the aristocrats and you would also have people who may not quite be the aristocrats, but the growing middle class. So, Goethe and Beethoven were one day walking in this garden and, you know, Goethe sees a group of aristocrats walking their way. Um, and there were people usually that you would quote unquote defer to. So this was people that, you know, you might move aside for, you make a path for them, you show your deference. And Goethe said, while he was, you know, come up from a bow to these people, Beethoven had charged like a bull through the crowd you know, straight through this group of aristocrats. And I think you can gather what Beethoven thinks of the class system based on this one anecdote. Now, did that mean that he didn't take money from them? Oh no, he was quite happy to take money from them. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But here's the thing, when Napoleon came on the scene, you know, 1770 is when Beethoven was born. 1776 
is when you have the American Revolution. Then 13 years later, you have the French Revolution that went on and off for about 10 years. And out of that, you get some guy named Napoleon, who is a Corsican, nowadays part of Italy, but back in the back then part of France, who is basically going through France, talking about and conquering different parts of Europe, talking about liberty, fraternity, you know, and, uh, and freedom. And so Beethoven was a fan. He liked the ideas that Nepo Napoleon was espousing. So at first, he actually um, dedicated his third symphony to Napoleon. Now, when Napoleon declared himself emperor, Beethoven was pissed. He was very, very mad. And he actually scratched out the dedication on the score and instead wrote to the memory of a hero. So it's dedicated to the memory of a hero instead. So Beethoven was definitely not somebody who shied away from letting people know about his personal opinions on politics, even though he didn't quote unquote actively take part, shall we say. So was Beethoven revered in his lifetime? And the short answer is yes. Beethoven did not die a pauper. Um, he actually, at the end of his life, accumulated a substantial amount of wealth that he was able to give and pass on to his brothers and nephews. And he himself, you know, at one point thought of moving away from Vienna because the cost of living at Vienna became too high. And all of these aristocrats got together and basically said, we can't let Beethoven leave Vienna because what would Vienna be without Beethoven? How can we call ourselves the city of music? So they decided to give Beethoven a deal they would give him an annuity, a certain set of money every year where it would cover his living expenses. And all Beethoven had to do was stay in Vienna. And Beethoven took the deal and the deal fluctuated a little bit. There were times when he didn't get paid the full amount or there were huge inflations at certain other times. But when you think about it, that is a fantastic deal for any artist. I mean, nowadays, there are very few artists that have this kind of deal. Artists tend to complement their artist artistic endeavors with teaching um, and or performing. And nowadays, you know, you might have the MacArthur grant or the Guggenheim that might give you a certain set of money for a year to say, go work on your creative endeavor so you don't have to worry about living expenses. But this was incredibly rare. And I think it shows to a certain degree how well known Beethoven was in his lifetime and also how much he was revered as a composer during his time. Um, here's the thing though, Beethoven then went through another bout of depression later in his life. And it has to do with his brother's death. Um, one of his younger brother passed away and he was in a custody battle with his sister-in-law for his nephew. And this kind of set him into a whole depression. And it wasn't, I don't think he was probably a good person to be raising a child, but in some ways, because he didn't have one of his own, I think he wanted to raise this nephew um, to you know, kind of pass on his legacy. Um, things were so bad that the nephew attempted suicide, actually. So Beethoven was, went into another bout of depression and he stopped caring about himself. He was not taking care of himself. Um, he was drinking a bottle of wine with every meal and he was not taking care of himself in terms of personal hygiene. At one point, he even slept on the street and got woken up by a policeman who thought he was homeless until they then realized that it was actually Beethoven. So I think from this, you can see that Beethoven was incredibly human. Um, he wasn't somebody who was pristine all the time. He let his personal feelings be known and he has some pretty public, you know, we can say meltdowns, I think these days, if we want to call it that. So was Beethoven a good businessman? Yes, he was. Um, he actually hired his two younger brothers to be his secretaries. And he was one of the first composers to start negotiating different contracts for his published works in different countries to make sure that he was getting the most out of his contracts. And as I mentioned, he had no problem taking money from the aristocrats. If you look at his pieces, in the title page of his pieces, they will often be dedications. 
and who are they dedicated to? Dedicated to? They were not dedicated to, you know, family members. They were usually dedicated to a count, to a prince, to an archduke, or to a prince. And why? Because these people gave him money. Um, sometimes it wasn't quite nearly as quid pro quo as I give you this money and you must give me the dedication. Sometimes it was. But most of the time, it's because Beethoven realized that these people have helped him substantially in getting him the musical opportunities he needs to build his reputation. Let me give you an example. Um, back in these days, there was no such thing as a professional orchestra. You know, um, these societies and these professional orchestras did not come in until the earliest, I want to say it was 1850. And if you are a composer and you have a new piece that, and you want to premiere to the public, you would have to hire players to come rehearse and perform. And it's expensive when you think about how many people are in an orchestra. So what happened was that he would hire people who were sometimes playing in bars, playing in coffee shops. And these people would come together for a day long rehearsal and then they will perform in the evening. I mean, that's insanely long day. And also these weren't the best players either. And that actually contributed to a lot of why Beethoven did not receive good reviews of a lot of his music during his own lifetime, especially at the premieres, because oftentimes they were poorly played. I mean, these people would rehearse all day, then they would perform at night. That's barely enough rehearsal to do anything. And it was hard to play, you know, and it was a at that time. You could play easily. Beethoven with music. Um, there is actually a Beethoven during number six, one of the piano a chord and an aria. So that was probably like a three hour long concert, okay? And probably more. And these people had just that day to rehearse. And he was, you know, in his journal, he was talking about Prince, Prince one of the Prince that he knew. I wanna say it's Nishnowski, even though I'm not completely sure, don't quote me on that. Um, have brought over food for the musicians, you know, and he could never have funded these ventures without the help of these patrons. And these patrons sometimes, you know, in addition to giving him food, uh, giving him money, also gave him a place to stay. Um, when he was in Vienna, there was a period of time where he was staying with one of these aristocrats. And one of these aristocrats asked him, you know, when he had visitors, asked if Beethoven would play for his visitors, Beethoven got super upset and he left in a huff because he's like, I am not your servant. And I think from that, you could see Beethoven's great objection to the class system at the time. He was not a fan of that. And he does not believe that an artist should be somebody who submits themselves to working for a church or working for like the aristocrats. He believed that I am just as good as you are and you don't get to boss me around. So I think in all of that, it paints hopefully a better picture of who Beethoven was. Definitely Plex, definitely somebody who had his own ideals and he stuck to them, but only when it was convenient for him in some ways. But he was also a person who went through a great struggle of his own internally and also he went through a lot of struggle during his time when you think about Europe at that time you had millennia of kings you know the idea that you were ruling by divine right and all of a sudden that was changing now people were thinking that maybe everybody's equal maybe not quite everybody you know not not because of who you were born to that you are better than somebody else so definitely somebody who was going through a turmoil time outside but also inside as well ah so now we get to aha <laughs> did Beethoven like coffee uh, the short answer yes yes it was known that Beethoven would count up 60 six zero beans 
every day, grind them up himself, then make himself a cup of coffee. There are coffee shops nowadays that have figured out that that's about the ratio of how you might make an espresso shot. So if you're ever interested in trying the Beethoven brew, <laughs> You just need to count up 60 beans, grind them yourself and see what that might taste like. It's probably gonna be a very strong cup of coffee. And lastly, Beethoven never married. That is true. He never married and he was very unlucky in love, shall we say. He was always looking for love, but he was very unlucky in love. Most of the time he set his sights on women that were beyond reach in terms of his social standing. He was reaching for people that he could never have. And there is a movie that's actually pretty well done with Gary Oldman playing Beethoven and it's called Immortal Beloved. And it's based off of a letter that Beethoven wrote speaking about this person as the immortal beloved and how he wants to be with this person. And the movie kind of recounts Beethoven's life through the search who this is. The book and the movie comes to different conclusions about who that is, but it makes for a good story. And I will say for the other parts, they actually, in my opinion, capture who Beethoven was as a person relatively well. So I encourage you to check that movie out if you want some good entertainment. It's called Immortal Beloved. And the music in it is recorded by the London Symphony Orchestra with Sir George Shelley. And I think it's lovely. So I encourage you all to check that out. I think um, I am good. I think I've come to a good stopping point in the lecture. And I invite questions if you have any. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Perfect. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah, if you have any questions, put them in the chat or feel free. You can unmute yourselves now if you have some questions about Beethoven. I personally learned a lot. Um, I'm not as uh, well versed with composers and great traditions uh, <laughs> of our time. So that was great to hear a little bit about him. So if you have any questions, please unmute yourself. You can do so now. Beethoven was resentful of the class, how society saw his family. Ah, okay. So when you think about back in these days, um, as a musician, before Mozart, before Beethoven, the best that you can hope for is to find a steady job, either as the Kapellmeister for you know uh, some aristocrat, which is what Haydn did, Haydn was the Kapellmeister for Prince Esterhazy in nowadays kind of hungry Czechoslovakia area. Or what Mozart's dad did. Mozart's dad worked for the church. I think he was working for the Archbishop in Salzburg. Back then, that was the most stable job that you could possibly have. Bach was working for Leipzig, um, the St. Thomas Church and school there. So Mozart wanted to break out on his own. M Mozart's dad had actually lined up a really great job for him. But he's like, no, I want to go to Vienna. I want to be a freelance musician. I want to put together my own concerts. And Beethoven kind of was following in that footstep. You had the growth of the middle class, which means more people were able to afford to pay for a ticket to go to a concert. And I think people of Beethoven's time knew about his family background. They knew that he came from a musical family. They respected him as an artist. He was kind of that archetype of your romantic artist, somebody who isn't afraid to, you know, let people know what they think, or and people, and somebody who was a romantic in terms of expressing his views in a very um, direct way. So. As you know, the princess and the aristocrats, I think, respected him. This is not that all of them did. There were definitely people in there who thought he was, you know, too good for himself or he thought too well of himself. So there were definitely people who were not a fan of him. And part of it is because he wasn't shy about letting people know his opinions either. So if he didn't like a politician, people knew about it. Other questions? I wanted to know, this is Ginny Leppert. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I wanted to know if you know anything more about all the media, 
hype there was a few years ago about Beethoven died of lead poisoning from the river or something like that. Did you read about that at the time? I don't think I read that. Although here there are so many about you know, why he died or how he died or why he went deaf. Um, back in those days, ob obviously the sanitary conditions in Europe was not good. And this actually ties into the coffee thing. So mm -hmm. before um, coffee was kind of a thing in Europe, most people in Europe actually drank beer um, because it wasn't safe to drink water without boiling it. And most people weren't boiling their water or didn't know that they were supposed to boil their water. And when coffee came to Europe from the new world because coffee is an equatorial up, um, people all of a sudden were going, wow, we get a lot more done drinking coffee rather than drinking beer. And, you know, Beethoven wasn't the only composer that loved coffee. Uh, Bach also loved coffee too. Bach actually was a whole coffee cantata, which is between a daughter and a dad. And the daughter is just like, just give me coffee. I don't care who you marry me off to. The dense version of that story. Um, Beethoven most likely die from some sort of, um, most likely, this is once again a theory, from something that was digestive, like internal digestion, bad digestion of his life. And basically by the last day of his life, his stomach was also addicted too, like he had bloated, he had stomach, the fluids. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what was in the office, but it was not surprise me if at the time there was huge lead pool all around Europe at that time. Hmm, I lost her again. Hello? Uh, I've heard uh, another theory, I'm Matthew from Duluth, a very retired physician, that uh, because of his deafness he got depressed and so he drank too much, so he got cirrhosis of the liver and ascites, that is, huge collection of fluid in his abdomen, and they attempted to drain it. And of course, in those days, it got infected, and that is what wiped him out. Another thing about him that a uh, Mayo Clinic geneticist named Jaime Gordon uh, expounded on uh, was that he had uh, tertiary, that is, third degree syphilis, uh, and that is in an unusual way uh, presented with his hearing loss. I don't know how accepted that is or documented, but uh, that's propounded by a pretty authoritative uh, non-musician anyway. And it was easy to imagine getting syphilis in those days, which isn't very nice, but you gotta be realistic. <laughs> I heard about the liver and the sclerosis of the liver I actually believe that was part of his autopsy. Um, as for the syphilis one, I am not sure. I have also heard that rumor as well though. And he would now have been the first um, romantic composer to be associated with that disease. Schubert died of it. And it's most likely that Schumann went crazy because of it. So unsurprising. I would not be surprised if he did have syphilis. Other questions? How radical, how radical was his music in those days? Uh, that's what the impression I had is they were just used to uh, the Bach and Haydn and Mozart and then Beethoven came along with this dramatic uh, music. Was it pretty shocking? Yes. So let me give you a quick example of what made his music so shocking. So up to now, up to when Beethoven wrote his first and second symphony, people tended to start a symphony with this slow action. Then you would go to something a little bit more lively called the Allegro. And Beethoven decided to start his third symphony with these two quick booms. I mean, he just jumped right into the Allegro. And that was considered unprecedented. And people were just like, what is he doing? You know, why don't we get our slow introduction anymore? So this was definitely something that the audience considered shocking at the time. 
And also what Beethoven did was he put the emphasis of the symphony, he shifted, he slowly shifted to the last movement rather than the first movement. First movement used to be where kind of the meat and potato was and, of the symphony. The second movement is usually something slow, something lovely, something graceful. Third movement is usually a minuet that was based on a French dance. And the fourth movement was just supposed to be like dessert. You know, it's supposed to be something light and frothy that you can then go home kind of maybe singing the tune with. But what Beethoven did was he slowly shifted kind of a lot of the important things into the fourth movement. And the fourth movement became longer and longer and longer and much more substantial. So these were just two of the things that kind of shock the audience at the time. That's great. I believe Art, did you have a question, Art? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, good. Uh, I'm wondering I know, at least I believe, Mozart wrote the Ninth Symphony when he was totally deaf. Did he write any other symphonies or music when he was totally deaf? So here's the, where the definition gets a little tricky with the idea of totally deaf because Beethoven could still feel vibrations. And even when he was writing those last pieces, he was still doing them at these piano with that hearing machine. He would build this huge cone that would go over, you know, where the piano kind of, where the lid is nowadays in a grand piano. So I don't think he was completely deaf ever. I think he could still kind of hear things, but he could never hear in the spectrum that probably we can hear too. Does that make sense at all? Yes. Okay. Thank you. No problem. And we've got time for a couple more questions. I saw Lindsay had a question, if you have any book or documentary uh, recommendations. Yes, um, here is one about Beethoven Ninth. And I believe it's called, let me do a quick search, but I think it's something called Following in the Steps of Beethoven Nine. Uh, following the ninth, the step, uh, the first step of Beethoven's final symphony. It's a documentary and it's about how Ode to Joy especially has made an impact worldwide. I mean, this was what was hanging in Tiananmen Square when those students were protesting in Tiananmen Square in 1989. This is what was playing, you know, at the Berlin um, Wall when it came down. Every year now in Japan around Christmas time, around the end of the year, you would have thousands of singers that learn that Ode to Joy and hire an orchestra just so they can sing Ode to Joy. So this is talking about kind of the power of that Ninth Symphony. The Ode to Joy is the EU's anthem. So it's got a lot of power. So I definitely recommend that one. Yes, uh, thank you Zach for putting that, yep. Um, the other one, if you're curious about finding out more about that hearing machine, um, I think it's just called, if you put in Beethoven's hearing machine, it's free on Vimeo. It's a video that's free right there. The movie, I would definitely recommend Immortal Beloved because I think that they actually do a good job of trying to tell his story. And, you know, it's by a good director with very good actors. There was a movie, I think, called Copying Beethoven with Ed Harris. I'm not so crazy about that one, but that's a personal opinion. <laughs> Let me think, books wise, there's a really famous um, biography written by Maynard Solomon, and it's about Beethoven. So that is also something that's worth checking out. And that book definitely, I think is where the movie got some of their ideas in terms of thinking about the immortal beloved. Perfect. Where's the last? He wrote the string quartets. I'm sorry, what was the question about the string quartet? Was, was the last things that he composed the string quartets? I right. believe so, yes. And those string quartets are amazing. And I would encourage everyone to go check them out. They will feel a little strange. I can't remember whether the Misa Salamis was the last thing he wrote or not, but definitely worth checking out. The Misa Salamis can feel very strange at times. And you're like, wait, this is a mass? And wait, what is he doing? So, you know, 
like a lot of other composers, Beethoven, as he got older, got more and more into studying box fugues. And his music became more and more involved with fugue writing as he grew older. So, you know, one of the famous string quartet has a gross fugue in it. A lot of the piano sonata towards the end also had this idea of a fugue. And you hear that a little bit in the Ninth Symphony as well. Not a full blown fugue, but fugue like. Let's see. Um, and everyone, just for time's sake here, we're going to get everybody off at one o'clock. So, if any further questions, please reach out to Ruth. Uh, via email. I put it in the chat there. I want to thank everybody for tuning in to our virtual alumni college lecture series. Uh, it's been a great lecture there. Worked nicely for us to hear a lot about Beethoven and the history. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. And if you're interested on February 22nd, it is the anniversary of the Miracle on Ice. And we have someone from our office, actually, Bruce Berglund presenting on the Miracle on Ice. And we have fu uh, future and further events uh, about life on Mars, um, getting into the sciences a little bit. We have an astronomy lecture in the works as well. So lots of great stuff, uh, lots of great alumni college lecture uh, presenters. So keep tuning in for those lectures. Uh, thank you, Ruth. That was amazing. Like I said, I learned a lot and I'm sure a lot of our alums and uh, current uh, students of yours will reach out with some further questions and comments. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Ruth Lynn. Great job. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks everybody for coming.